Um, hey everyone, uh, my name is Jess Bergman, not to be confused with Jess Butler, I'm from HOT. Uh, some people think that we're the same, we're not. Um, but I um, work with our community partnerships and our um, corporate programs and um, I want to talk a little bit about what it means to sustain engagement with disconnected mappers and with some of our most vulnerable uh, populations of individuals. Um, if you aren't in the habit already, every 10, 15 minutes um, a week, uh, I try and set aside to just think about like big questions in life. Sometimes that's related to work, sometimes it's definitely not. Um, but one of the big questions I've been asking myself a little bit lately is when we're talking about kind of local people and local tools, adding to this open knowledge and really leveraging the local knowledge that our communities have, how do we really build and create more inclusive environments for the most vulnerable populations of people? Um, yesterday I was sitting in a really interesting conversation where we were talking about like, what would it look like for somebody who's directly affected by a disaster to be able to leverage technology to mark, hey, my house has been destroyed, or hey, um, like the Facebook notifications that you get to say, like, I'm marking myself as safe. Um, but one of the questions that came up was sometimes with our most vulnerable populations, those are the individuals who quite simply don't have access to the technology that would allow us as organizations and responders um, to kind of get there and inc incorporate those individuals in response. Um, so it got me kind of thinking, like, how is it that we can identify who these disconnected individuals are? And how is it that we can really engage these communities and, and leverage them in all of our programs and activities? Um, through the HOT microgrants program, we've started to try and address some of those fundamental barriers like access to technology, access to data and internet, making sure that kind of we can create some of those connections and then provide some additional training to help communities to kind of get started and get launched. But I've started to recognize that there are more barriers than just the fundamental ones and that providing individuals with technology quite simply isn't enough. Um, so we've been supporting communities um, through the Hot Microgrants program and then as Tyler alluded to earlier through a US aid funded project called the Women Connect Challenge. And so I've been thinking about a lot what it means especially to uh, engage and connect women um, in leveraging this technology um, and what not just those fundamental barriers are but also some of those social barriers are that prevent women especially um, from getting engaged. Um, so let's say that we kind of eliminate one of those fundamental barriers. We provide the technology to help communities get started with mapping, right? But imagine that you're an individual who until this point has just been using a simple mobile phone to do um, mobile banking, kind of some simple SMS messages to your network. And now you literally have kind of the world at your fingertips. Right? You can connect to individuals on Facebook, you can message through WhatsApp, you can jump on Twitter, do a Google search, access YouTube, yes, for the entertaining videos, but also for educational ones. How is it that I can grow um, my entrepreneurship skills or how is it that I can access certain networks within my own community? And now we've added this world and it's hard for us to take a step back and get this individual to say, but why would I invest in mapping? Right? And a question that came up yesterday in a conversation that I had at a table was, um, how do we kind of bridge that gap? Because we know that mapping is important for the organizations that we're working with to kind of reach those vulnerable individuals. But how do we bridge that connection so that an individual living in an affected community or a non-affected community can actually see the practical impact on their day-to-day -day life that um, maps can have? Right? And so I've started to kind of just think about, like, how is it that we convince this individual that mapping is important, right? Because they have this technology now, let's say we're still giving them a data bundle or something to try and go out in their communities and do mapping on a weekly basis. What's the incentive that we're providing or what is it that we do to kind of get this type of individual to keep going? Um, there's a lot of kind of things that I know that people have tried and uh, tested and I'm so glad that um, Shamila from Hot Uganda, which is where I work out of, um, kind of came before me and talked about some of the approaches out of the Hot Uganda office. Um, thinking about training and sensitization, how do we just engage people who haven't engaged with maps before to understand the practical use? What types of incentives do we provide for participation? Do we provide direct pay to individuals for their time? Or are we looking for people to be inherently motivated, right? But then I also ask this question of like, so what happens when our project is no longer running? What happens when some of our teams start to pull out and the funds disappear? 
Now, if we're not providing data bundles on a weekly basis, what incentive does that individual have to invest their own time, their own money, and their own resources? Especially for some of our vulnerable populations where there's a huge opportunity cost associated with giving up even 30 minutes in a week, right? So I don't have any solutions. That's not why I came to give this talk. Um, I came to just ask really critical, kind of fundamental questions at the core. Um, and I'm here because I want to hear from you about what we can do to kind of identify these populations that we want to take ownership over their local maps. And how is it that we can actually create and sustain our local communities, the ones that we might not be thinking about right now in our decision making at the table. So how do we help individuals and communities to overcome not just the simple barriers, but some of the more complex social barriers? Um, how do we eliminate selection bias in our field and community programs? Oftentimes, we need to go for efficient and simple and cheap. But oftentimes, we're then um, deferring to individuals who already have technology skills, who already have language skills, et cetera, et cetera. And we're not thinking about how to build a more inclusive culture when we're thinking about who we're training at the community level. And then the last question is, how do we, as a global community, all of the brilliant minds who are sitting in this room, um, provide some of those innovative spaces um, and be more creative in including individuals in our environments and making them more sustainable for our disconnected mappers and our more vulnerable communities. Um, so I don't have the answers, but I do want to talk through because I know that some people are doing some really amazing stuff and thinking about how we can get more of these individuals and communities to the table and making sure that they're included as we continue um, to build out our global map. So here's my contact. I'm not on Twitter. I'm trying to avoid it for as long as possible. So come find me. Um, send me an email. I'd love to have these conversations with you over the next couple of days.